Dr. Richard Dobir trabalhou no Departamento de Agricultura de 1972 a 2008, onde liderou diversos projetos de pesquisa para mitigar conflitos homem-natureza. É autor de mais de 200 publicações científicas, tendo recebido diversos prêmios e reconhecimentos. É um dos fundadores do Comitê Nacional de Risco da Fauna dos Estados Unidos. Auxiliou na investigação do evento Milagre do Hudson. Hoje é consultor da indústria de aviação e assessor científico da USD. Good morning. Bom dia. Uh, it is my honor to be here today to make this presentation and I hope uh, in speaking in English that it will be clear to you uh, the concept I'm trying to present because I personally feel it is a very important uh, concept if we are going to uh, mitigate the risk of wildlife and aviation. Uh, I would like to start out by saying how do we uh, evaluate wildlife hazard management programs uh, at airports? In the United States, this problem is uh, one of a uh, regulatory driven process, uh, which I believe is the antithesis of what we should be using in a safety management system. And what I mean by regulatory uh, driven process is that airports in the United States are required to have a wildlife hazard management plan by law. And if the airport approves that plan, which details how they're going to try to keep wildlife <coughs> off the airport, then uh, they are in compliance and uh, with the law and uh, everything is okay. And they have their annual inspection every year and if they're uh, found to be in compliance, uh, everything is, is fine. But there's no objective procedure for telling an airport how well they are doing in their plan or where they need to improve. There's obvious things, you know, maybe they have uh, a body of water, uh, that is attracting waterfowl or they have a, uh, a garbage dump near the airport that's attracting uh, vultures uh, that that they should be dealing with but there's nothing to, to evaluate are they doing a good job in mitigating those risks and um, and so what happens is that you'll get an airport manager or an airline that uses an airport and they want to know how does our program to manage the risk of wildlife compare to that of other airports uh, in our country or in other countries? How good is our wildlife management plan? Or for an airline, how good is the plan at this airport that we're flying into and using? Um, are we getting good value uh, risk mitigation for the money that we've invested in uh, in trying to mitigate the risk of wildlife. Uh, are our landing fees for an airline, are they being put to good use by the airport to prevent bird strikes? And right now in the United States, and I think most everywhere, we do not have an objective process in place to provide answers to the airports or airlines. And uh, I would just ask, what process does your uh, civil aviation authority or military authorities use to evaluate their wildlife hazard management plans or whatever you would call them in your country. Um, I suspect the answer is there's really uh, nothing very objective. Now, is there a solution to this problem, this dilemma? And I propose that the National Wildlife Strike Database in your country can be used to play a key role in providing objective benchmarks of an airport's performance in mitigating risk compared to other airports. It's like getting grades in school for your academic work. You have to have some kind of a benchmark to measure are you a C, an A student, a C student, an F student. And, um, and without having that objective information, no one is really held accountable 
no one really takes it seriously. Now, I believe the database can provide that scientific foundation, that objective foundation. And just in this schematic, you take your database, first of all, it has to be a good database. It has to uh, uh, you know, accurately reflect the strikes that are occurring on airports. And I might mention, I think Brazil is doing a very good job right now in developing a database, and they're producing annual reports and uh, I commend you for that. You're way ahead of many countries in that regard. But you analyze those data. You don't just collect data because you like to collect data. You have to analyze it. And that can be difficult, but it can be done. And then you get uh, quantitative knowledge out of that. And that knowledge can be used, if you apply it in the correct way, to give you power power to improve your wildlife hazard management plan in a way that is most effective to mitigate the risk of bird strikes and other wildlife strikes. Now just to give a brief summary of our database, which we developed, started back in 1990, um, currently we're getting about 14,000 strike reports per year. And this is just civil aviation, but military is kept uh, separate in the United States, although we do combine the data sometimes, but the databases are kept uh, separate. Uh, and this just gives the overall pattern of strikes that are being reported. Now, this does not mean the problem is getting worse in the United States, because if we look at strikes that cause damage to the aircraft, uh, we see we've actually had a decline since about the year 2000, which I believe is related to the aggressive programs we have implemented on airports to mitigate the risk of, of strikes. We're getting much more complete reporting of all the strikes that occur on an airport. That's why the total number of strikes uh, is increasing, but the actual damaging strikes are declining. Now, um, what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 15 minutes or so is the data from 2011 to 2015. And I'm only going to use the data from the 100 busiest airports, that is the number of movements, aircraft movements per year, uh, for uh, these five years. And uh, you can see we have about 34,000 total strikes. And of those 34,000, 1,000 and uh, or 1,800 of those strikes have an adverse effect. Now by adverse effect, I mean a strike that either causes you know, direct damage to the aircraft, like a broken fan blade, or it um, has an adverse or a negative effect on the flight, like an aborted takeoff, because the pilot saw vultures in front of him sitting on the runway feeding on a uh, a carcass that should have been removed, uh, and he aborts a takeoff. He doesn't actually strike the bird, but uh, perhaps he uh, uh, does damage to the brakes of the aircraft or uh, in some way negatively affects the, the flight. And so these are, uh, even though a bird was actually not struck by the aircraft. So this is my definition of, a, uh, of, of, of an adverse effect. Uh, strike. And if we filter the records from those uh, 34,000 uh, total strikes in the database, um, you can see, in, and I want to break it out, this is the other second important point I want to make in my talk, we break this out by strikes that occur what I call on or very close to the airport environment at under 1,500 feet uh, above ground level, and strikes that occur outside of the airport environment at greater than 1,500 feet above ground level. And I will explain why we, we do that. Uh, I think it's very important. Now, when I use the 1,500 feet, you might say that's somewhat arbitrary, but this is my reasoning for dividing the airports, uh, the strikes, into those two zones. Um, 
strikes that are above 1,500 feet are usually outside the airport environment of where the wildlife hazard management plan, which is the term we use in the United States, uh, on the airport to mitigate the risk. Uh, and these strikes that are outside the airport environment are important uh, because when pilots are flying an aircraft into or out of an airport, uh, they may encounter birds at 20 kilometers out or 10 kilometers out uh, on descent or on uh, departure, and uh, they can do significant damage, as, as we'll see in a moment. And uh, they are associated with that airport because those strikes are occurring as an aircraft is trying to either depart or, or uh, land at that airport. They're not in route strikes. They're totally away from the airport. And, uh, and so these need to be considered and tried to be dealt with. It may take avian or bird detecting radar, working with air traffic control to help guide pilots around these uh, these uh, these birds, or it may require uh, land use changes that are beyond eight kilometers from the airport. And I'll use this diagram to give you an example. You know, when a plane is, is approaching an airport, it's typically on a three degree glide slope. And at about uh, 1,500 feet AGL, it's going to cross that eight kilometer distance from, from the airport. And in the United States, with our regulatory process, an airport is responsible in their wildlife hazard management plan for land uses within eight kilometers of the airport to work with communities and, and, uh, and private entities to eliminate uh, bird attractants in, within that eight kilometer distance that would enter the uh, flight path of aircraft. Beyond eight kilometers, there's really nothing. And flight 1549, the miracle on the Hudson, gives you a great example of that. That occurred, you know, beyond eight kilometers, above uh, 1,500 feet. There was really nothing that the biologists and the management on the ground at LaGuardia Airport in New York City could have done to mitigate that risk. That's something that would have to be mitigated with air traffic control uh, working with the pilot uh, to avoid those geese uh, that were migrating at the time uh, at that in, uh, distance. This is why I like to divide strikes that are under 1,500 feet and greater than 1,500 feet as, as, a, uh, as our metric that we're using. And just to go through some quick examples, you know, this is a Canada Goose strike that happened at 100 feet on uh, uh, liftoff from an airport in New York City. And obviously, that's a problem of the airport. And if the airport has Canada geese grazing or gulls sitting on the runway, this is something they need to deal with. They're responsible legally to mitigate that risk. This is an example of a, uh, a jet in uh, South Carolina that collided with a deer on takeoff in the middle of the day. Uh, obviously an airport problem caused by uh, a fence that was not uh, secure. The deer could crawl under it very really easily. And, uh, and this is uh, a problem on the airport. Uh, a coyote uh, uh, collision that occurred did uh, significant damage to the uh, tires of this aircraft uh, caused by holes in a, you know, a very uh, ill-kept uh, security fence that had several problems, holes and uh, vegetation over it. So you know, these are pretty obvious uh, events of strikes on an airport. Uh, this was an osprey uh, at a, uh, uh, on an airport environment. And this is a Swenson's Hawk uh, <coughs> the, at uh, Dallas Fort Worth Airport. Uh, and uh, all are problems caused by birds that are attracted to the airport for food, water, or cover. And in this case, you know, why would these hawks be, these Swenson's Hawks, for example, be on the airport? Well, this is a photo of a uh, red-tailed hawk, another common UDO uh, type hawk in America. <coughs> 
uh, on an airport, and why would that bird be on the airport? Well, it's there for food, and uh, in this case, it has appetizers and entrees to feed from uh, on the airport. But you have to manage uh, the vegetation and on the airport and the rodent populations to keep these types of birds away. So these are all examples of under 1,500 feet. Above 1,500 feet, uh, you know, this is an iconic uh, photograph of what happened in uh, New York City. And as I've already mentioned, this was a strike event that had could only be controlled by integrating air traffic control into the uh, uh, mitigation process for wildlife and aviation. With one exception, I might add, which will be talked about tomorrow by my colleague Travis DeVault, of using onboard aircraft lighting systems that may help birds detect and avoid aircraft. But these are the kind of things that have to be dealt with greater than 1,500 feet. And uh, as I uh, mentioned uh, before, and just one last example, this was uh, white pelicans at uh, 5,000 feet on approach to an airport in Arkansas. Okay. Um, now, if we're going to, getting, getting back to my subject of using adverse effect strikes to, uh, as a benchmark uh, to measure an airport's performance, um, should we use total number of strikes that occur in an airport as a measure of their uh, effectiveness of their program, or lack of effectiveness of their program? And my answer is a very definitive no. Um, strike rates in an airport, overall strike rates, all species, is not a valid metric because the hazard level of species varies tremendously based on their size and behavior, the, the likelihood that they will cause damage to an aircraft, and the completeness of reporting of all strikes varies a lot on airports. Some airports are very good at reporting everything they find that may have been struck by a plane, picking up carcasses on the, on the runway, even if a pilot did not report the strike and reporting those. And that's very good that they do that because it gives a very good uh, a picture or analysis of what birds are using your airport. But, um, but this does not translate into measuring the effectiveness of that airport. Um, and, and I'll give you an example of this. Uh, and, and by the way, we usually, any strike that causes an adverse effect, damage or a negative effect on flight, we usually get that reported and can enter that into our database. So it's a much more complete picture. But as an example, just looking at uh, bank swallows, which are you know, a small insect eating uh, flying bird, uh, soaring bird, aerial forager, uh, if you look at the number of damaging strikes or adverse effect strikes compared to the total number of strikes, it's, it's very small. Whereas something large like a Canada goose, uh, you get a, uh, a much uh, uh, more likelihood of having an adverse effect on flight. So if in an extreme, if one airport reported 230 strikes and another reported 180, uh, you'd and, and they were all swallows on one airport and all Canada geese on the other, you certainly would not say that the airport on the left was more hazardous than, or had a, a greater problem than the, than the airport on the right. So we want to use adverse effect strikes. That's what I, I uh, propose. And, um, and if, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they incorporate the hazard level of species struck and they also, there's much less bias in airports in reporting adverse effect strikes. So we can get a much more valid comparison of the two. And, um, and, the, and, and if we think about it, the bottom line of all of our work is it's not necessarily to prevent all bird strikes or wildlife strikes. It's, it's to prevent those that are going to cause an adverse effect on the flight because that's what can lead the economic losses and ultimately to loss of life and loss of uh, aircraft. And so those are the strikes that we really want to focus on. Um, and so 
you know, now we're going to get to the meat of my paper here. Um, if we can agree that adverse effect strike rate is a valid metric, then what are these rates for U.S. airports? And I use the adverse effect strike rates per 100,000 aircraft movements uh, in comparing airports. 100,000 movements is, is arbitrary. It could be 10,000, it could be a million, but the numbers come out nice and, and uh, it's something I think we can all grasp by using 100,000 uh, as our divisor uh, in the calculating the rate. And so here's what we get for those 100 airports across the United States um, in ranking them in terms of the adverse effect strike rate. You see we have, let me see if I can use this, uh, where's the, I'm trying to find the, uh, well, it's not very bright, but anyway, you can see we have an outlier uh, right here at Sacramento Airport, which is in a valley that grows a lot of rice, there's huge migration of, of waterfowl uh, during the winter, and that is our outlier in terms of a, um, uh, adverse effect strike rate. But you can see the distribution is fairly normal, and we have a median strike rate of adverse effect of about 0.97. That means approximately one adverse effect strike for every 100,000 aircraft movements uh, is the median value for these 100 airports. Uh, 50 airports are below that level, 50 airports are above that level. Uh, and in that is the, is the uh, range. And this is important too, is there a bias in adverse effect strike rates by the size of the airport? Uh, do busier airports have fewer adverse effect strikes because maybe there's so many aircraft flying that it disturbs the birds and they stay away? Or do smaller airports uh, uh, have a, a, a difference? And the answer is no. If you if you use a look at a correlation between the number of aircraft <coughs> movements and the adverse effect strike rate for those 100 airports, uh, there is no correlation. Again, we have the one outlier out there of Sacramento up in the upper left-hand corner, but um, there is there is no bias, and this is very important from a uh, statistical point of view. Now, if we look at the rate for strikes that occur uh, at greater than 1,500 feet, obviously the adverse effect strike rate is much lower uh, because we have fewer strikes as you gain altitude uh, or, or height above ground level, but uh, the pattern is much, uh, much the same as we saw with strikes at less than 1,500 feet. Uh, the median is 0 0.17 strikes per 100,000 movements, or about uh, a fifth of one strike, or five strikes for every 500,000 uh, movements, you could, or, or one strike for every 500,000 movements. Uh, it's about a one-fifth of the level we had for strikes under 1,500 feet. And again, we see no correlation between the size of the airport, the number of movements, and the adverse effect strike rate, which is a good thing from a statistical point of view. Now, if we look at all of these, uh, if we compare the adverse effect strike rate uh, for at less than 1,500 feet on the uh, horizontal uh, axis there, and uh, the strike rate, uh, adverse effect strike rate uh, above uh, 1,500 feet uh, on the vertical axis and compare the two, uh, what you find you see is that the area in the, in the pink zone, those are airports that have uh, adverse effect strike rates that are above the national average, both for um, on the ground, under 1,500 feet, and away from the airport, at greater than 1,500 feet. And that cluster of strikes in the lower right-hand corner uh, there are uh, uh, ones that, whoop, excuse me, that are uh, below the national average. So it just gives you an idea of where your airport 
fits in the relation to this thing. And you might, uh, you might say, for example, uh, an airport uh, like uh, that's up in the upper left hand, somewhere oh, up, up in the upper left hand corner there, there's somebody that needs perhaps to be investing in avian radar, bird detecting radar, because they've got a lot of strikes that are occurring uh, uh, outside the airport environment greater than 1,500 feet. And perhaps there are things they can do to mitigate that risk uh, by uh, using uh, avian detecting radar. And uh, now, so this asks the question, if, if some people don't like the use of benchmarks because they say, well, if my airport is below the benchmark, I'm below uh, 0.97 strikes per 100,000 movements, uh, below 1,500 feet, I don't need to do anything to improve my risk. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, doing well. And, uh, and the answer to that is no. You know, if you're, no matter what your strike rate is, you want to, your adverse effect strike rate, you want to strive for zero, but at least it gives you a measure, a benchmark of where you are in relation to other airports and to a national median value. And, um, and I'll just use this example from JFK Airport as a specific way this data could be used. If you look at the red column or a row there, JFK Airport uh, averages about 7.4 adverse effect strikes per year based on their strike rate of 1.76 and the number of movements they have. And each of those strikes cost on average about adverse effect strikes about $158,000. And so that's a co annual cost of about $1.16 million. This is on average. And I'll talk about that economic value tomorrow in another talk. But if JFK said as a goal, we want to reduce our adverse effect strike rate down to 0 0.9, we're going to implement these programs to try to disperse and get rid of those birds that are causing that at these adverse effect strikes. And we could bring it down to 0.9, that would result in an approximate savings to the airlines of about $564,000 a year in economic uh, reduction and in, in economic losses. So that's just a, a way this could be used. And um, now on the other hand, if your airport has a high adverse effect strike rate, you're one of those airports that are in the upper uh, level of the, uh, beyond the medium there, uh, should you be criticized or penalized for that? Well, maybe so and maybe not. It, it just depends. But at least we know you've got an above average uh, uh, strike, <coughs> adverse effect strike rate. It may be that you've, uh, you're in a very bird rich geographic location that makes it very difficult. You may have an inferior wildlife hazard management plan that really needs to be improved. Or you may have a good plan, but you've got poorly trained, motivated people, and they're not implementing the plan. You know, a plan is only as good as the people who implement it. And so it's, it's, if you have a high adverse effect strike rate, you, at least you know you have that rate, and it's a red flag, and you should try to get more financial resources, better training, a better plan, whatever it takes, to try to reduce that strike rate, drive it down lower, set objectives, and you know, we're going to reduce it. But at least it gives you an idea of where you stand. Right now, most airports are oblivious as to whether their uh, program is, is good or not, and they have no specific goals to try to achieve a better, uh, a better uh, adver a lower adverse effect strike rate. And I think this is very important. So I'm going to... Um, in my talk with uh, just a few comments, you know, is it really fair to compare airports when one airport has more wildlife inherently present than another airport? And it's, it's similar to, I think, the debate we have in, in our education system where schools do not like to be compared in terms of the performance of their students because some schools may be in an economically 
uh, disadvantaged area and, and the students do not get much support at home and so their performance is poorer than in another district. But we still need to compare, and they, all these may be true, but we still need to compare their performance <coughs> so we know where each of these school districts stands. We need to do the same thing with airports. Um, we compare runway incursions on airports. We compare uh, uh, all kinds of near misses of, of aircraft on approach and departure. We, we compare airports for many other things. Why should we not compare them in terms of their performance in mitigating the risk of wildlife strikes? And uh, even if they are very different, and as an example, uh, this compares Phoenix, Arizona, which has a very low adverse effect strike rate, but it's in a desert. It doesn't have a lot of birds compared to JFK Airport in New York City, which has a high adverse effect strike rate, but it's in a very bird-rich environment and very challenging environment. But we still need to be able to compare those and have airports like JFK set goals, such as we're going to try to reduce this adverse effect strike rate from 1.76 down to 0.9, as I mentioned. And this is just another example of uh, uh, Orlando Airport, if you go to Disneyland, lots of water around that airport, lots of birds that migrate there in the winter in that area. It's a very challenging environment, and uh, it needs more resources right now than they're providing to uh, mitigate the risk. And so, in, in conclusion, if you cannot measure or quantify a problem, I don't think you can manage the problem. You have to measure things in order to manage them. And data are critical to measure and quantify problems. And that is why for every nation, uh, every aviation authority, national aviation authority, it needs to be a high priority to have a good wildlife strike database so that you can evaluate these programs and set goals to mitigate uh, the risk. Uh, it provides, it's, to me, it's, it's, uh, it's in, impossible to manage the risk without measuring uh, the risk through a data, national database and then using that database to provide benchmarks by which airports can uh, uh, move forward. And I might mention, getting just the final point, is that these are numbers, you know, 0.96, 0.97, 1.5 uh, for a risk. But what needs to be done then is once you have that adverse effect strike rate, you look at the species on your airport that are causing those adverse effect strikes, whether it be vultures or deer or Canada geese, which you would not have here, of course, but whatever it is, and then you need to adjust your plan to mitigate against those species. You know, obviously there's something you're not doing that is allowing those species to continue to hit aircraft and or be hit by aircraft and cause adverse effects. So it gives you specific areas where you can work on. And with that, I'm going to um, say obrigado and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't know how much time we have, but thank you.
Professor, how do you compare this um, adverse strike rate? How do you compare this adverse strike rate with the average mass uh, strike rate of the species? I remember a presentation by Dr. Carter uh, two years ago. Uh, it seemed to me that it was a giant a giant job, a giant work with you and Nicholas Carter about this average mass uh, strike rate. How do you compare these two metrics? Yes, the, you know the question is the. Uh, how does the mass of the bird, the size of the bird, uh, enter into this? Uh, there is a, as would be expected by the laws of physics, there is a uh, strong correlation between the size of the bird and the probability that it will cause damage uh, to the aircraft. Uh, as, as I mentioned in my example with the swallows, comparing swallows, a very small bird with Canada geese, and so, uh, if an airport has a high adverse effect strike rate, uh, as I mentioned earlier, or I mentioned at the end of my talk, it is very likely that the reason it has that high rate is that it has species that have a large body mass uh, that are frequenting the airport, whether it be uh, vultures, or uh, caracaras here in, in uh, uh, Brazil, or you know some other species <clears throat> that are causing those uh, adverse effect strikes, and so the airport uh, needs to look at the species that were uh, that were causing those adverse effect strikes, and in fact we we present a report to each airport every year listing all the adverse effect strikes they've had and what species cause those and then they need to fine tune their management plan uh, to address those species and make sure that they're doing enough or whatever they can to, uh, to mitigate the risk uh, with those particular species. But uh, in, in general, uh, yes, the larger the bird more likely it is to cause damage to the aircraft. And uh, that needs to be addressed in the plan. Mais alguém teve uma pergunta? Pode ser feita em português a pergunta. Mauricio. Tudo bem, pessoal? It's better for me. É, antes de mais nada, é um prazer, uma satisfação revê-lo. Né? Nós estivemos juntos aqui em 2004. É, a pergunta é o seguinte, o senhor disse que tem acompanhado um pouco uh, o, o nosso banco de dados, que tem melhorado bastante ao longo dos anos. Só que inversamente proporcional, o número de ocorrências que nós temos tendo vem crescendo de uma maneira assustadora. Naquela época, 2004, a nossa preocupação é que nós tínhamos uma média de 12 a 15 eventos por mês de bid strike. É, atualmente, nós estamos tendo uma média de 30 a 40, chegando a 45 meses, quer dizer, 1 ou 1,2,3 por dia. Quer dizer, agora eu sei que a minha companhia Azulinha da Leste provavelmente deve estar tendo um bid strike hoje. Quer dizer, o que, que você atribui à melhoria no banco de dados e esse acréscimo de quase 100% ao longo desses 12 anos, Gilmar? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, but I believe uh, that it, you make the point that I'm trying to make in my talk, I believe, in that um, your database is improving, you're getting a, an improved culture of reporting strikes and, and, and through the efforts of uh, Sanipa are being entered into a database and, and accurately and so as that occurs you're going to see an increase in the number of strikes reported and that's why I feel it's so important that in, when you analyze those strikes every year they should be analyzed and you want to look at yes the total strikes that are being reported but most importantly 
the number of those strikes that are causing uh, an adverse effect, which is an economic cost to your company, for example, your airline, and, uh, and, and see what the trend of that is, and particularly what it is at different airports that you fly into. And then you're in a position to put pressure on that airport, on those airports that where you're receiving adverse effect strikes in order, and you've got objective information to say, you know, we would like to see improvements being made in, in, in your program. And, and you can combine that, you may have observations from your pilots about where they see birds when they are on approach and departure and, uh, and other information. But uh, that's why I think having a, a, a strong database with a good culture of reporting strikes uh, is, is so important if we're going to make progress in this, in this uh, whole arena. You have to have hard data to show the airports uh, and the aviation authorities uh, that improvements are needed or hopefully in the long run that improvements are being made and you're seeing the strike rates go down. So. Mais alguma pergunta? Não? Mais um. Olá, bom dia. É, eu trabalho no, na Latin Airlines como especialista em manutenção e dentre uma das responsabilidades que, que eu tenho seria é, em relação ao risco do, de board strike. Nós compilamos os dados e enviamos para o CENIPA e uma dúvida que eu tenho seria em relação a se existe um feedback nos Estados Unidos das ações que são feitas pelas administradoras aeroportuárias e se esse feedback é público, se as companhias aéreas podem consultar é, ou se é só via ofício ou algo relacionado a um documento. Oh, perdão. É... Answer to that question is: Does does the public, or airlines uh, in particular, or the public, have access to the efforts being made at an airport to mitigate the risk of strikes? And the answer is yes. Uh, you know, airports in the U.S. are are uh, in almost all cases public entities, uh, and uh, so the information in, uh, that they collect in in the in their plan, all their plans, all their activities is public knowledge. Uh, for example, uh, airports uh, have to report every year how many birds they kill, you know, in mitigation, shoot with a shotgun or trap and, and, and remove. Uh, that all is detailed records which is available to anyone. And also is part of our management plans on airports Almost all airports keep track of how many uh, uh, pyrotechnics they fire you know, to frighten birds, the numbers fired per month, uh, the uh, runway sweeps they make to disperse birds, you know, all the activities they do uh, to mitigate the risk are documented. Uh, you know, fixing the fences, repairing the fences, removing uh, standing water in areas that is attracting birds. Uh, all of these things are uh, uh, available and, uh, or, or should be available, and in almost all cases there are. So that information is available and can be uh, accessed. And also our, our wildlife strike database, our national database, is accessible Anyone can go online at the Federal Aviation Administration and download the database or, or segments of it that they want to look at and analyze it themselves. And so we try to be as transparent as, as we can in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, actions we take. And one last point on that that's important is, you know, almost 
all of the birds that we deal with, and I'm sure the same is here, is are protected by federal law in the United States under a, a Migratory Bird Treaty Act that we have with Canada and Mexico and the Soviet Union and or Russia and Japan. Uh, it's a, a, a multi-country migratory bird treaty act. So any birds that are uh, that are killed in the efforts to mitigate the risk of bird strikes that are protected, that all has to be done under permit and it all has to be documented and it's you know, very public uh, knowledge, also very controversial at times. But uh, so that's my answer. É uma informação. Existe uma uma boa relação entre as políticas públicas nos Estados Unidos e a presença de aeroportos nas cidades e o risco aviário, porque aqui no Brasil, pela primeira vez, nós estamos tendo uma lei 12.725 que talvez agora a gente tenha condição de uma melhor relação essa que eu estou perguntando e com efeitos os melhores em termos de cuidados. Good question. Uh, and my answer to that is <laughs> it varies uh, widely among uh, municipalities and airports, as you would imagine. But in most cases, uh, there is a good relationship. And part of the reason this is, is because of the database we have. If an airport can demonstrate that it is having adverse effect strikes and it can show with reason that those strikes are occurring because of some land use that the municipality has near the airport um, such as a, a landfill or other unsanitary conditions or, or a wildlife refuge uh, a park or something then uh, the city is much more likely to cooperate with the airport uh, in, in trying to alleviate or mitigate that problem because they realize at that point, now that there's hard data that they, the, the airport has to show them that if a, a tragedy were to happen or a significant, highly cost expensive strike, uh, they might be held liable for that. Uh, if they had been notified by the airport that this was an attractant and it was causing a problem at the airport and they ignored it, uh, they would be in, in, in an exposure of liability. So uh, I think I've seen over the last 20 years a much greater cooperation between municipalities and airports in um, alleviating uh, uh, these, these risks. It's not perfect. And you know, obviously there, there are situations where there's still conflict, but, but the database provides a key tool or, or <coughs> management uh, action to help these municipalities understand that their land use policies can affect aviation safety. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dubir. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your time. Pessoal, 